Hi everyone, I'm Stan Maller. Welcome to Paranormal Yakker. My guest on today's show is Maria Wheatley. She's the UK's leading authority on geodetic earth energies and ley lines, a second generation master dowser, and has explored, written about, and lectured on many of the world's ancient sacred sites. I'll be talking with Maria about her groundbreaking book, The Secret History of Stonehenge, Ancestral Mysteries, and Lost Civilizations. The book turns archaeology as we know it on its head and reveals what the mainstream archaeologist won't tell us. Maria Wheatley, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Hi, thanks for having me, Stan. It is great to be here. Dowsing, Maria, is obviously in your DNA since your dad, the late Dennis Wheatley, may his soul rest in peace, was a world-renowned master dowser. Do you recall when you became interested in dowsing? What was there about it that attracted you to it? And by any chance, do you recall your first dowsing experience? One of my first dowsing experiences, because I can't remember the first, but one of the really interesting ones where my late father just hid some coins and said if we could find it, it was me, my brother and I, and he said, if you can find it, you keep the coins. So <laughs> there was a good incentive there. So uh, off I went and I found it very easy in which to do so. And then as I got older and more mature, he taught me dowsing and how to recognize many, many different forms of earth energies. And he himself was taught by a European master dowser. And I was likewise taught by that European master dowser and Chinese geomancers as well. My late father inherited all of the unpublished and published manuscripts and surveys of yet another master dowser before him. So some of my Dowsing and Legacy archive goes back to 1899, and it contains surveys of Stonehenge before the war and what it looked like after the war as well. So, I mean, it is really a legacy that I've inherited. Do we know, Maria, how old then Stonehenge is? How far back in history does it go and who built it? It's really interesting because there are controversial dates. I mean, the orthodox archaeologists say the second phase of Stonehenge, that's the Stonehenge that we're familiar with, with its gigantic lintels, was about 2500 BC. But the first stage of Stonehenge was around about 3100. But there has been some charcoal analysis of carbon-14 dating of that charcoal and seeds found there that date it to 8,000 years ago. But that's not the main date that's mooted by the archaeological community. I think it does go back that far back in time. What was the reason or reasons the original builders of Stonehenge chose the site they did to build it on, and what was its intended purpose? Great question. Stonehenge lies on awkward sloping ground. If you were an engineer, you would think, oh my goodness, I've got to put some stones down further than the others to make a perfect circle for the lintels. So it's an engineer and nightmare. So why did the ancient choose that ground? It's not what you can see, it's what you can't see in terms of the earth energies, the deep aquifers, the, the lays, and many other things besides that create what's called a geodetic power center. That's when you have more than just a crossing of lays. That's when you have lots of different types of earth energies coming together to create that power energy point. That's what the ancients were looking for. And they built the first phase of Stonehenge, which was 56 blue stones from Wales, about 150 miles away, in a very large circle, surrounded by a white henge bank, is how the archaeologists describe it. But in my legacy to archives, I've got the notes of the custodian of Stonehenge in the 40s and 50s, that was there at the original dig of the Henge Bank. 
when Professor Richard Atkinson was excavating it. Atkinson told the British people, and indeed the world beyond, that it was just made of chalk rubble, but Tom Gorey, the custodian, disagreed, and he said it was built so that they created a mound and then chiseled out a white bowl. So it wasn't just a white chalk henge bank, the whole of that henge was in fact white. That's phase one. Phase two, they took down all of those stones and then created the stone henge that we're familiar with today, with a few stone settings that I say are missing. Who built it? Then you said, who, who built it? Well, we know through a DNA, ancient DNA sampling of all of the Neolithic skulls and numerous Bronze Age skulls, that the ancient British DNA was eradicated in 2480 BC. That means that the very, very tall beaker culture people that came to the British Isles about 2500 BC must have had, uh, they these two people, that's the Bronze Age, very tall beaker people, the ancient Britons were long headed and much smaller in stature because of their femur bones have been measured. I've measured femur bones. So you've got these two cultures, right about 2500 BC. The long headed people's DNA, like I said, was a uh, eradicated in 2480 BC. But the interesting thing that Professor Ian Barnes has noticed about the DNA analysis is the two cultures didn't mix for 500 years. Then there was a tipping point. What that tipping point was, we're not quite sure of, but then the people started integrating and marrying. So imagine very short people and very towering, much, much larger people. That's the British Isles, and that is from uh, ADNA analysis. And uh, do we know the original intent purpose of it, and did that change over the years? I think Stonehenge had two main points. If we go back to one of the earliest written accounts, of Stonehenge. It was by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century. He wrote a book called The History of the Kings of Britain. He included Merlin, King Arthur, King Bellinus, Brutus, many, many kings, not just Arthur. And he said about Stonehenge, no stone at Stonehenge doth not have healing power. So I think it was a healing center to begin with. Now, Professor Tim DeVille and the late Jeffrey Wainwright also agree. They think it was a healing center. And they even told us how you can use the stones with water to cure ailments and different types of illnesses. I think that was an integral part. If we go to another ancient manuscript written in the 18th century by John Wood, then he says it was known as an oracle center where people came to hear oracles from the stones, for example, a bit like Delphi is to the ancient Greeks, was an oracle center. Intriguingly, those, the oracle center of Delphi is related to Stonehenge because the great healing sun god, Apollo, was said to have left Delphi at midwinter and arrive at Stonehenge. So the two oracle centers are definitely linked. And so I think that was a couple of its aspects that have been written in recorded history. And we can look back and make analysis of the probability of what the people were doing there. Certainly my research in the Bronze Age uh, about four and a half thousand years ago, suggests that the ancient people, the tall beaker people, for instance, they dressed very finely, the priesthood, in fine silk-like clothes. They wore gold trestles in their hair. They had huge amber breastplates and they had incense bowls, a bit like a church censer where you swing it and the incense comes out but they weren't burning incense, they were burning opiates through the residue deposits has been found. So I think they're in a very altered state of consciousness if indeed they were given the oracles, just like the hallucinogenic fumes at Delphi's Oracle Center. Why was Stonehenge built in the shape it was built? And what was the significance of 
building it that way. It's iconic. There's no other stone circle like it in the world. In England, Scotland, Ireland, the British Isles, we have surviving over a thousand stone circles. And they are just that. They're standing stones in a circle. But Stonehenge has those lintels. Stonehenge originally had three concentric stone circles. One of the large sarsens with the lintels on the top and then two concentric circles of blue stones. So it was completely different. There's been many other researchers back in the 70s and 80s, one of whom is called Dr. Don Robbins of what was known as the Dragon Project back then. He said that there was a certain way that you can encode stone. And you could encode stone by putting a force shock onto it. That's like hammering it. Yeah, you're putting, and they, he believed as, as you hammered into that, you could put a thought projection into that. And with the lintels on the top, that almost contains this programmed energy. Certainly what people have seen, whether that is the case or not, what per people have sometimes seen at Stonehenge is a corner of the eye kind of manifestation of someone very tall has been commonly reported when I've taken people there. So perhaps the circle produced these apparitions. More than that, in Dowsing terms, a circular shape generates concentric circles outside of itself and with inside of itself. In geomantic terms, that's called form energy. Now that form energy could be a circle cast of salt on the ground by an occultist that will generate circles within and without. And it's believed that helps manifest things, the circle. It has a lot of symbolism associated to it. So I think that's a side to Stonehenge that's very metaphysical, but has indeed these paranormal properties associated to it that could help manifest. When Dr. Don Robbins was researching a stone circle in Oxfordshire called Rollwright, he saw, and he was quite a scientific person, he was a great archaeologist. He made headways in archaeology in analysis of chemical compounds of the stomach content. And he saw along the road a huge black dog manifest. And so there, there are these strange accounts that have been witnessed due to the circular shapes of stone circles. The uh, stones that were used in the building of Stonehenge came from far and wide. And you mentioned that earlier. And as I'm sure you must know, there have been many theories about how they got transported to where they are. What has your research found? The main model by archaeologists is you use roller, wooden timbers to roll on. But when that was demonstrated by Professor Richard Atkinson with some schoolboys moving a, a, a very small stone, not the size of the ones at Stonehenge, they didn't get very far. They just did not get very far. But in my research, what I've noticed with earth currents that are always associated with ancient sites, castles, manor houses, churches. I mean, the list goes on. And if we imagine an earth current being like a river that has water obviously flowing through it, imagine that as energy beneath the ground. That's an earth current. They can be male, female or hermaphrodite. Both. These earth currents that we've measured with copper probes going into the ground, we notice that one hertzian frequency that seems quite common is 25 hertz. If the ancient people were able to manipulate sound, and indeed they could, and they could change that to 25 kilohertz, which is much faster per second than a hertz frequency, then 25 kilohertz is the frequency of levitation. And maybe it could help lighten the stone as well. I mean, theories do abound from different forms of levitation used by energy currents, or, or lines, that's what some people say. But I really think they could lighten the stone. Stone has very unusual properties that we've recorded coming out of the stones. The other thing I'd like to point out about the long-skulled people when we're talking about, you know, hearing different frequencies 
is that their ears were not in the same place as we were. Imagine I've got a long skull and my ears are offset to the back. The anthropologists said that time and again about these long skulled people. It's in the written medical record. They also said that their bones in their ears were different as well. And I gave that account to a doctor that works in London's A&E department, accident and emergency, we call that. I just realized you probably wouldn't know that uh, terminology. And she said, that's impossible. And I said, but what if all of these reports are accurate? And indeed, that is correct. She said, well, then they could possibly hear differently. So I think that maybe their experience of the ancient world, we're very visual people. We look at the stone circles. We look around at the landscape. Maybe they could look and hear was their dominant sense. In the secret history of Stonehenge, you take your readers on a worldwide megalithic odyssey from Stonehenge to Egypt. What, Maria, is the Stonehenge-Egypt connection? There's lots of connections between the two. If you imagine in the ancient world, there was a, a kind of similar, not identical template that they were using with certain types of earth energy. Certainly, you have a lot of very wide and powerful lays, ley lines that link the two. So there's a great connection there, especially with the Giza Plateau and some of the Nile temples then what the ancients were looking for at Stonehenge because Stonehenge is unique and I'd like to say obviously the Great Pyramid is unique there's nothing else like it in the world they both have similar earth energies that rise out of the ground they're called alpha earth energies that come out of the ground and emerge is very, very powerful it's like a force coming out of the ground Stonehenge has that at the altar stone the great pyramid has that as well so that's something that they share in common that's not necessarily found at other stone circles what also they share in common is having a very groundwater aquifer that's rainwater filling up an aquifer that is beneath uh, major sites worldwide but also a much 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 deeper aquifer that is not groundwater but what water diviners esoteric water diviners say is water born with inside of the earth chemically produced by rock these produce different patterns for example, the very deep water often produces a spiral pattern that water diviners are familiar with, whereas groundwater tends to manifest when it's running in streams or rivers, a chevron pattern. And what do we find at Edvu Temple on all of the pillars? Well, on some of the pillars in that temple space, the chevron pattern saying that underground water is present. And the water table at Edvu Temple, dedicated to uh, Horus in part, is only 16 feet beneath the surface. So we see all these different kind of encodements at our ancient sites, such as Stonehenge and the pyramids. So whilst they're very different visually and in engineering terms, they share very similar earth energy patterns. Your book, Maria, reveals two types of Neolithic long skull people, which you've addressed. Do we know when and where did they exist? And do we know at all what caused their demise? Yes, that's interesting because there were two types contemporary uh, in the Neolithic period. That's from about 5,000, 6,000 years ago to about 4,500 years ago. That's their time frame. And the Neolithic that had what which I call the hyper elongated skulls, they were very long. And they had been put through a board, a cradle board, and they had scarring coming down here, which shows that they had some pressure. And also they made the back of the head very flat. They had very narrow faces. If a long skulled person was by mine, that, that's how big their face was. They were very, very narrow and long skulled. And then you had the naturally 
lesser elongated type of person that had a long skull, but they hadn't gone through the cradle boredom process. So they appeared to be more of the serving class. And the kind of elite had the extended skull. Why do I say that? At the same time period, and we're connecting Egypt with Stonehenge again, at that same time period in the Neolithic, say, for example, 3000 uh, BC, in Egypt, you had what's called retainer burials. A retainer burial is would be when the pharaoh passed, he's deceased, and some of his very loyal servants would go with him to the grave. That's called a retainer burial. And it went out of fashion sort of about 2500 BC. In Stonehenge and the surrounding area and parts of the British Isle, they too had retainer graves. The elite person that was the long skulled person never showed any sign of having a damaged skull. So they hadn't been hit or sacrificed or had a ritual killing, which was deemed very sacred right up into the Iron Age recorded by Caesar. So the long skull person would be laid to rest, uh, dying of causes uh, of normal death, while the smaller long skull people show signs of ritual uh, burial, sacrifice, processes. But I don't think, they didn't, didn't show wounds that they were going away from it. I think it was an honour to do that. By the late Bronze Age, some of them were being murdered by the very tall beaker culture, but preceding that there was retainer burials. But they too, at the same time as a ancient Egypt, went out of fashion and that was stopped. So I think the cultures were very, very closely linked. Apart from the two types of long skull people you write about and just described, you discovered one burial close to Stonehenge that was similar to author and a paranormal researcher Lloyd Pye's star child. However, the Stonehenge star child had a tail is there any explanation as to why that star child had a tail? It is a mystery. It, it really is. I mean, if you imagine you're on the axis line to Stonehenge, meaning that's where the midsummer sun rises and the midwinter sun sets, it creates a line. It's called an axis line. On that axis line some distance away, that's where that long barrow is situated close by. So it's in a prestigious position for one. The other very interesting thing about that burial, which is unprecedented, didn't occur anywhere else, is it was surrounded. If you imagine the being was in the center and long skulled people were placed around that burial. That's not how any other burial in that era was done. So it just simply was not. And the antiquarians, the early archaeologists that discovered the interment of that long baron were stopped in their tracks because they saw a skull that had eyes on top of its head, a bit like what Lloyd Pye describes, and a tail. Now, I wrote to Ted, Dr. Ted Robinson, who worked with Lloyd Pye on the Star Child Project. He's a doctor. And I just said the report to him, what do you make of this? Could it be spina bifida that causes some kind of deformity to create a tail? And he was ruling those out. So I can say a doctor ruled that out, the same doctor that worked with Lloyd Pye. We don't know any more about it, but the antiquarians, early archaeologists that found it, were so disturbed by that burial, they left it in situ. It's still there in the landscape. So, I mean, if it was to be re-excavated, then maybe we'd be able to find answers to that through DNA analysis, etc. But it is still in situ. You, Maria, have said that we have been misled by archaeologists and Stonehenge is not quite a as we know it. You, of course, write about the two phases of Stonehenge, which you mentioned previously. I was wondering by any chance, what is the rationale, if indeed there is one, for archaeologists misleading us? Well, they have mis misled us because if we look to the plan by English Heritage of Stonehenge, 
which is the iconic picture that we all know. And you start to question that through the, the archaeological reports that don't match that by Hawley, Colonel Hawley in 1901 and in the 50s and 60s by Richard Atkinson, they don't match. Now, I wrote to Professor Mike Parker Pearson of UCL, University College London, and said, it could Stonehenge have had two concentric circles of blue stones at the very beginning and the lintel stone circle, which is not how English heritage portray. And he said, yes, I agree. So we agree with that. But the other archaeologists that say that's the model of Stonehenge don't. Why did they do that then? Because they're led by how some antiquarians drew it in the 16, uh, 1666. There was John Aubrey. Then there was William Stukeley in 1724, followed closely by John Wood. And they all said, this is what Stonehenge looks like. But they certainly missed some stone uh, settings because the earliest, the first excavation, so now we're going back to 1624, yeah? A long time before William Stukeley, for example, in 1724, well, it's near enough a century ahead, he was the first one to excavate it. And he said at the center of Stonehenge, it was Indigo Jones, he said at the center of Stonehenge, there was two altar stones and he was the architect of King James the first. So the first archeological dig was James the first of England, James the sixth of Scotland with his architect Inigo Jones that designed the Banqueting Hall in London. I doubt American listeners know of the Banqueting Hall in London, but it's very, very famous if you're a, a Brit. And also with the Duke of Buckingham, they were digging. They even told us where they took that second and altar stone. They carted it away to St. James's Palace. They told you where they took it. St. James's Palace was the main residence of the monarchy before Buckingham Palace. So it was the, the original palace. So that's where it went to. English heritage say, no, it only had one altar stone. But up until the 1930s, Archaeologist round about that time, William Cunnington, he wrote to St. James's Palace, he was a, an archaeologist, and he said, can we have the second altar stone back? And the royal door was firmly closed in his face. And nobody has asked ever since about that altar stone. So I think it's in it's maybe some part of St. James's Palace, maybe Wilton House, which was associated with Inigo Jones and James I, which is not far from Stonehenge. So now we've got two altar stones. We need physical evidence. We need more than an account written by somebody in 1624, your listeners may ask. So I looked at the archaeological reports by Atkinson and many others, and I was looking for a different chips, shards, we call them, chippings of stone. You've got lots of chippings of blue stones there, 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 sarsin stones, there, there, the green blue uh, sandstone that's there today. And there was another darker chippings of a kind of sandstone that, that was then made of the altar stone geology. That's what it was. It was a form of sandstone. So I found the physical evidence as well. So I think given all of that, the, there is a strong probability that there was two. I think the light one represented the masculine sun and the darker one was the feminine stone there. That's what uh, I suggest that they were. And I think they were put in a very prominent position above a very deep aquifer as well. Now, I have to say that, that reading your book there, I was astounded to learn that the powerful stones at Stonehenge were defaced by a government department and one stolen by royal decree. Could you expand on that? Yes, the one that was stolen by royal decree was the fact that that second altar stone was taken away to St. James's Palace. But proceed in choosing the altar stone, what the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers, wanted was the then leaning greater trilithon, meaning the biggest stone at Stonehenge. It was leaning and he offered the farmer, the landlord, the landowner, money for it. And the landlord said, no, 
you are not having that stone. That's why they took the altar stone. All, and it was because James I would have had to have given permission to the Duke, George Villiers, which happened to be his lover. He was married to Queen Anne of Denmark. But uh, he was uh, friendly with uh, with the Duke and he would have given the Duke the right to have taken that. So it would have come by royal decree the, the English heritage was formally run by a government department called the Ministry of Works. The Ministry of Works looked after Stonehenge from about the kind of 30s, 40s and 50s, thereabouts. And it was noticed by the custodian of the site for more than 25 years that a very unusual stone once stood. It still stands. Uh, it's stone number 51 in the numbering system adopted by archaeologists of Stonehenge. It had a two foot hole that you could put your hand in. And the custodian mentioned time and again that no matter what the weather was, whether it was drought whether it was windy, whether it was still weather, that hole, that two foot hole inside of that stone filled with water. And they didn't know where the water came from. There was a really big investigation. He got water diviners in, he got geologists in. Nobody could figure out where that water was coming from because as soon as they turned their backs, it would fill up. It's almost as if it was magical water. People started to hear about this and then put the water on eczema ailments and said it had healing and curative properties. Then the Ministry of Works didn't like the idea that people were queuing. Some people were putting rubbish in, trash into the hole. Others were cleaning it out. And so in what the Ministry of Works did, they concreted it up with plastic and cement. But today, when you look at that hole, you can see it's had water runoff come down it. So you can physically see that it did once contain water. So I'd like to see that unplugged and see what would happen. There are a lot of ancient sacred sites on our planet. You have visited and explored a good number of them. Do these ancient sacred sites have a common denominator or denominators? If so, what are they? I think so. They have their own individualism, but they do contain different things. For one, there's quite often uh, lots of concentric circles of earth energy that sometimes found at particular sites. And that would then say it's going to be a stone circle or it might be a circular building. So if we go to Sardinia, for example, which is uh, in the Mediterranean, they have what's called Nuragi monuments, a Nuragi monument, and it's circular. And it often has other circles around it. It's, it's very ancient. There was thousands of them on the island of Sardinia. They were very similar in placement to a, a stone circle above concentric circles of energy and that's what they were looking for then and they were corbelled meaning they come up into a kind of round section a bit like the white house top building a lot of them were corbelled and that can enhance its believed earth energy so they were looking for the concentric circles but what i noticed about sardinia and stonehenge in phase one and two because as I briefly mentioned before, Stonehenge was surrounded by a huge six foot chalk white wall carved out of the ground. So if you imagine that back in the day when you were walking towards Stonehenge, you can see what was inside of it. Not unless you were there. Today it's exposed and you can see it. That's not how the ancients experienced it. It's white, finished off in white chalk because there's chalk beneath the ground, just like the pyramids in Egypt were, you know, finished off, if you will, with limestone, very smooth limestone finish. In Sardinia, their long barrels were painted vividly with reds, yellows, browns black and these are natural substances you get red and brown and yellow a beautiful golden color from ochre 
hematite. And that's found in abundance around Stonehenge. So I suggest that just like the Sardinian long barrels, that Stonehenge, Henge Bank, was painted. In fact, Professor Mike, Michael Parker Pearson was in Dorset and he noticed in an excavation of one Henge Bank that was a very similar size to Stonehenge, that it was carved with a chevron pattern, concentric circles, and spiral patterns, all of which are the surface pattern of Earth energy. Cannot be coincidental. And I think they were painted onto Stonehenge, possibly at the entrances or places of significance to the ancient people that went there. So I see different ideas in different countries mirroring what is going on in one part of the world is going on in the other part of the world. The other thing that is quite common in like places like Ireland, Scotland, uh, France, for instance, is a feminine shaped stone, which is like a diamond shape like that, uh, or a phallic shaped stone, which is like that, like more column like, and they're deemed masculine and feminine stones across the, the British Isles and far, far beyond. So it's almost like the ancients were adopting that and using the shapes of stones to have meaning to them as well. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy The Secret History of Stonehenge or any of the other books you've written, learn about the tours you organize, services you offer, such as past life regression and tower readings, or find out about the esoteric courses you teach? How can they do that? You can go to the Avebury, A-V-E-B-U-R-Y, the Avebury Experience .co .uk, or you could go to esotericcollege.com. That's my teaching platform. Or if you want to find both, just go to Maria Wheatley. Dot UK. So it's mariaweekly.uk and that will take you to the landing page to my other site. I've got some free events coming up on the Avery experience and that's to celebrate my book launch with free talks on Zoom. You just literally click on Zoom on the date and time that's there or I've got, you know, in person your book launches as well. Plus I will be dousing ancient America in Charco Canyon in August the 25th and the 26th as well, because I've doused many different parts of ancient America. You live in a wonderful country that has some wonderful ancient sites. Maria Wheatley, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It's been an absolute joy yakking with you thank you thank you stan hi everyone this is stan mallard of paranormal yakker i hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched so that you don't miss any upcoming shows be sure to subscribe to my free youtube channel to do that just press the subscribe button on your screen